learn from history? Do we just learn facts? Is history simply for the purpose of facts? I suggest that if we don't take time to review history so that we can learn lessons from the past, that we cannot go forward. And so it is with her story, her story. We're going to be looking at her story over the next uh, four weeks or so. And so we invite you in to uh, looking at times where Jesus was interacting with a woman in his time in the first century. And what is it that we might be able to learn from that interaction, from that situation, from that setting? And so we invite you into that place. I invite you to turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 7. We're going to be reading verse 45 to uh, chapter 8, verse 11. John 7, verse 45 to chapter 8, verse 11. With the Word of God open before us, let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit, we pause and we seek to acknowledge you and your presence here yet again. And we just ask, Lord, that your word, your stories would speak to us here and now that we would learn, that we would engage, that we would understand just a little bit more of who you are and who we are before you and how to live a life in response to that. Indeed, Lord, would your Holy Spirit teach us, encourage us, nudge us here this morning, we pray. Amen. We're going to be reading, uh, starting at uh, chapter 7, verse 45, and it's going to sound like we're entering into the middle of a story, and we are. Um, but I, I need to, it's a bit of a backstory to what's actually happening in chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. And so I want to start there rather than reading the whole chapter 7. And so I figured if we start there, then everything else will come to light as we enter into that. So, chapter 7, verse 45. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in, him being Jesus? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Has any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who we met last week, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Then each went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Thus far the reading of God's word. And all God's people said... On January 25, a car crashed into the Curtis Community Center. 
I'd like to show you the video clip of that event. Reactions? There were two main reactions to the story. Gosh, I hope no one was hurt. Or, whoa, I wonder what was wrong with that driver. I'm not sure which reaction you had, but if you followed the feed on Facebook or if you followed the story in the news in the following days, then you would have seen that second reaction take root and prompt more curiosity. A 36-year-old woman was charged with endangering life, and speculation rose to new heights. And speculation moved to condemnation as outrage grew at the atrocity of such an event. The accusations of mental health began as conjecture. (laughs) She must have been crazy. She was off her rockers. She was probably from Ontario Shores. But then when the truth about her mental health came out, it only served to solidify the pronouncement. What is it in us that we move so quickly to judge and condemn? What is it in us that finds others so guilty on one action? By what authority do we decide between compassion and condemnation? Compassion, condemnation, I think this is at the heart of what Jesus is faced with, compassion or condemnation. Earlier in chapter 7, the crowd that gathered at the Feast of Tabernacles began to wonder, is this Jesus the Christ, the promised Messiah? A debate occurs within the crowd, and it ends with the statement, When the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this Jesus? As if to say, he must be the Christ. The Pharisees heard of the crowd whispering such things about Jesus, so they sent the temple guards to arrest Jesus, and that's where we started reading this morning. The temple guards came back empty-handed. Why didn't you bring him in, they demanded. Because no one ever spoke the way he does, the guards replied. Have you been duped too? The Pharisees ask with derision. And then these leaders say something very telling about their character. They say, verse 9, the mob knows nothing of the law. There is a curse on these people. These people are accursed, it says in the Greek. Now, in rabbinic law, which the leaders followed, it states that six things are laid down about the people of the land. (laughs) People of the land refers to the ordinary, simple people who do not observe the regulations of ceremonial law. (laughs) People of the land. So the leaders say six things are laid down about these people of the land. (laughs) Entrust no testimony to them. Take no testimony from them. Trust them with no secret. Do not appoint them as guardians of orphans. Do not make them custodians of charitable funds. And do not accompany them on a journey. Can you hear the arrogance of the leaders? Can you hear their contempt of the crowd, of the people, the people of the land? So the leaders take matters into their own hands. The mob is cursed. The guards are idiots. Who better to deal with Jesus than themselves? So they set a trap, and they are clever. They will wait till the temple is full of onlookers. And since there is a crowd, they know that there will be Roman soldiers posted throughout the temple, overseeing everything so that nothing goes out of control. There are no riots that are going to occur on their watch. Then the leaders wait for Jesus to arrive, and when he does, they bring in the woman. Now, 
let me ask you, how do you find a woman, how do you just find her caught in adultery? My answer is, you don't just find her, because you already know that an affair is going on. And the leaders did nothing about this affair earlier, but, but now she is useful for their purposes. But notice they only bring in the woman and not the man, which actually goes against Levitical law, you know, because both must be charged with adultery. So the woman is nothing but a prop. She is bait for the trap set for Jesus. She is nothing but an object in the eyes of the leaders. And I wonder, which is worse? They're using her as an object or her act of adultery? You know, I'm compelled to just carry on with the script I got, but, you know, j- just that insight into the fact that they looked at this woman as an object, as a tool for their purposes. I mean, not only is it demeaning, but I wonder how often we do that. How often in our society have we done exactly that? Looked at women as an object, or as a tool, a means to an end. You know, whether it's, you know, we need a woman on our committee so she can take notes, to, I just want a a warm meal when I get home in a, a clean house, and everything in between. As I think about that, I think about shame. I think about regret. And I wonder what gives us the right to do that. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. (laughs) Commanded us. To stone such women. Can you hear their contempt and arrogance? Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Jesus sees right through their tactics and he is grieved. It's no wonder that he bends down. I wouldn't be surprised if he was hiding his tears. Compassion. And so we see the contrast between the Pharisees and Jesus. The Pharisees are all about condemnation, and Jesus is all about compassion. And this contrast should not surprise us. There were, after all, two streams of thought running throughout the Jewish religion, two variations on what the second greatest commandment should be. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. First commandment, we all agree on that. And keep the Sabbath day or love your neighbor as yourself. Which one is the second greatest commandment? We know which side of that coin Jesus landed on, love your neighbor. And clearly the Pharisees landed on the other side, keep the Sabbath And so this is the fundamental difference between Jesus and the leaders of the Jewish nation in his day. And I can't help but think that that this difference is even here today. There are those among us who are strict about rules and rule keeping. And there are those who grieve as people hurt, who weep when others weep. I like to think that this debate is about where authority comes from. At the heart of authority within Christianity, is it keep the Sabbath or is it love your neighbor? Which is it for you? What motivates you when you judge someone? 
Is it compassion or is it condemnation? What is your go-to determination about the nature of another human being? I think as I reflect on Jesus' teachings, as I notice his actions towards others, I think Jesus' heart of authority comes from a place of compassion. And if that's true, then let's see what Jesus does next, shall we? We last left Jesus kneeling down and writing on the ground with his finger. And the leaders kept pestering him. You know, what do you say, Jesus? Do we or don't we stone this woman? The religious leaders were hoping that no matter which way Jesus answered, that it was going to be a win-win for them. If he answered that they should be that she should be stoned to death, it would be usurping the Roman rule, and only Rome, Rome could pronounce a death sentence. <laughs> and if he backpedaled on the Moses law, he would be seen as a coward, and he would lose his reputation in the eyes of the crowd. <laughs> it was a win-win trap. <laughs> and we wonder, what was Jesus writing on the ground with his finger? Was Jesus simply buying some time to regain his composure? Maybe he needed to take a moment to, and to talk with his heavenly father first. Or maybe Jesus knew that they wouldn't let him out of the trap. So Jesus forced them to ask again and again, hoping that they would hear themselves asking the way that they asked and hoping that they would come to their senses. Or maybe, as I suggested earlier, Jesus was in such agony and pity over what they were doing that, that he just had to hide his eyes from them. I think our answer to the question, what did he write, is suggested by the next thing that happens. The Jews gave names to everything that they encountered in the Torah. So when it comes to naming the Ten Commandments, all they needed was one word for each of the Ten Commandments, and everyone else knew what came next. It's kind of like using an acronym, you know, for efficiency in speaking. You know, I don't tell you that I'm going to do self-contained underwater breathing apparatus diving tomorrow, am I? No, I tell you I'm going to go scuba diving. So it's kind of the same idea. So I wonder... If Jesus wrote down those ten words, reminding everyone about the Ten Commandments. And then he stands up and he says, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. And then he stooped down again, and he wrote on the ground. And I picture him completing the picture by, by drawing the stone tablets, you know. Those who heard clearly began to leave one at a time, the older ones first. It's interesting, right? And now they were trapped. Jesus placed the trap back squarely on their shoulders. Jesus may have been counting on the fact that if one person threw the first stone, then they would be the one to start the ruckus, and, and the Roman soldiers would come in wanting to know who threw the first punch. But Jesus also knew that the culture was based on shame and honor. So the older ones, having more wisdom, knew their own hearts. And their departure would signal to the younger ones to rethink their position. Everyone sins. Jesus knew it. And so did the religious leaders. And they left the crowd, dropping their stones on the ground as they left. Till it was just Jesus, the woman, and the crowd of onlookers. Jesus had compassion on the woman for the manner in which she was treated. Jesus also had compassion on the woman for the mistakes that she had made in her life. 
So Jesus took the arrogance and the anger of the religious leaders for, that they had for her and he placed it on his own shoulders. And you might say he stood in the gap. And Jesus, straightening up, asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she replied. I like to think that the lesson that we learn from this story is twofold. First, we are to judge ourselves before we even attempt to judge others. And second, our first response should be that of compassion. Matthew 7 verse 1 says, judge not lest you be judged. Jesus goes on to say that anyone who judges another is like taking a speck out of another person's eye when they have a plank in their own eye. Nicole reminded us of that this morning in our time of confession. Today, we might say that the stove is calling the kettle black. But that's probably only well known to those of you who are 100 years old. Or, or, right? No one else knows what that phrase means. Is that true? Well, ask somebody if you don't know. The first response of compassion is like a doctor who does not judge a person for the ailment that they have, but regards the patient first as a human worthy of life and health. And Jesus would say, so in everything do to others as you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Quite simply, We must always extend to others the same compassion that we would wish to be extended to ourselves if we were in a similar situation. Now, in case you're thinking, I'd never find myself in a similar situation. Lest we misunderstand what Jesus did for the woman, allow me to close with these observations. It would be easy to say that Jesus was light on sin, as if sin did not matter. But I do not think that that is what is going on here. Seeing that no one condemned the woman, Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. In effect, what he did was to defer judgment on her sin. He said, I'm not going to pass judgment on you now, so go and prove that you can do better. You have sinned, yes, go and sin no more, and I'll, I'll help you. At the end of the day, we will see how well you have lived. Remarkable, is it not? Jesus accomplished so much in one sentence. Jesus affords her a second chance. I know you messed up. But life is not finished yet. I'm giving you another chance. The chance to redeem yourself. You see, the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of second chances. And compassion. The main difference between the Pharisees and Jesus is the way that they handle authority. The Pharisees wanted to condemn and and Jesus wants to forgive. Jesus' starting place is love for others and the Pharisees started with love for themselves. And then challenge. Jesus confronted the woman with the challenge of a sinless life. Jesus did not say, it's it's all right, don't worry, just go on doing as you're doing. No, No, he doesn't say that. He says, you know, it's all wrong. Go out and fight. Change your life from the top to the bottom. Go, sin no more. You see, Jesus confronted her bad choices with a challenge to make good choices. And so, in effect, what Jesus did was to warn her. Like we all need to be warned, we are faced with an eternal choice. Either we go back to our old ways or we reach out to a new way of life in Christ. This story is unfinished, as most stories with Jesus' challenges are. The ending is yet to be written because every life is unfinished until it stands before God. Which leaves us with one more challenge. 
what will it be for you? Condemnation for the rest of humanity or compassion for the rest of humanity? The amazing heart uplifting thing about Jesus is his belief in humanity. And when confronted with someone who has gone wrong, Jesus did not say, you are cursed. No, he says, go and sin no more. And Jesus believes that with his help, a sinner has it in them to become a saint. Jesus inspires us with an unglimpsed discovery that we are all potential saints. So how will you view your neighbors? Sinners? Saints? What will you become? Sinner? Saint? At the end of the day, Jesus declared to everyone that this lady is not for stoning. Amen. Shall we pray? Faithful God, we acknowledge this morning that we can be quick to judge other people. There's a sense of self-righteous indignation that can feel good when we take it upon ourselves to call out sin in other people's lives. It's no wonder Christians have a reputation in the world for being self-righteous hypocrites. Forgive us, God. Be at work in us by your Holy Spirit. Remind us each and every day of your amazing grace and the depth of your love made known to us in Jesus Christ. Amen.